So I'm an assistant professor at Stockholm School of Economics and one of the founders of Flowminder. So I'll use my time to go through uh, a few of our cases and the work we've done with uh, mobile network data using private data from mobile operators. Uh, go through that real quick and uh, end up with a few uh, insights or comments about the, what, I, what we think is the, the future of using privately owned data in, um, for social good or for disaster response. I uh, hope that sounds okay, because that's what I prepared, so I won't change that now anyway, so you'll get that. So to go through our background real quick for those of you who don't uh, know about us, so we're a, a recently young nonprofit organization, tec uh, technically a startup incorporated uh, just after the, the Haiti earthquake. Uh, so in the last few years, we've managed to work with a number of mobile operators uh, and some donors and government agencies. So uh, as you might see also Rockefeller Foundation, which provided the, the necessary seed money for us to start up. And then we also had um, long-term collaborations with the Gates Foundation uh, and Clinton Health Access Initiative. And that goes back so all the Flowminer members are faculty members, academics, so this is all based on previous research using mobile uh, data for mobility tracking, specifically on disease. Uh, since uh, February this year, we're also part of the DataPop Alliance, uh, which is a policy alliance uh, with MIT Media Lab, Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, and ODI, specifically looking at, as you can see, promoting a people-centered big data revolution. So really looking at issues such as privacy, property rights, data literacy, to make sure that big data work for public good also incorporates all of those aspects. Again, you can see Rockefeller Foundation, so you can see that we've cost Hunter a lot of money uh, at this stage. We're very grateful for that. So the data that we work with, unlike crowdsourced data, uh, is then mobile network data. So this is mobile operator data that they routinely collect in their systems. So this is used to bill you money uh, or just to check that the systems are up and running. So a back-end data. Uh, basically, all operators, this is an international standard, uh, they collect in their systems the information about uh, where the cell towers are, how many mobile phones connect to each cell tower. Uh, and if a call is made, also then who's calling who, obviously, to see how long the call is and if it's a local call, international call, or roaming. So this is the data that um, we've collaborated with a number of operators uh, working with. Uh, and again, just to mention a point, so this is not GPS data. Uh, and all the data that we ever work with is anonymized because we really don't care whose phone it is or who's the person. What we're interested in, as I'll show you later, is the large mobility patterns, essentially commuting patterns. Uh, so the resolution is not GPS level, it's, it's tower level. Uh, and again, it's, it's all anonymized. So uh, our team then uh, first started working with this data operationally in uh, the Haiti earthquake. So uh, another of the co-founders worked in Haiti as a medical doctor after the earthquake. And of course figured out the same problem as everybody else in this room, that in order to provide an effective disaster response, you need to understand where people are and, and in order to provide the right resources to the right people at the right time. So we were able to get a collaboration with Digicel, which is the largest operator in Haiti, uh, still our, our, uh, best, uh, one of our best partnerships, and we're able to work on their data to provide mobility estimates, just essentially aggregating all their cell phones in their system and see where, where they were. And again, this work started weeks and months after the actual earthquake, so this was not the immediate disaster response, but this was more for the reconstruction phase. Uh, so provided those estimates to different aid agencies and UN agencies and, and also did maps after the, the cholera outbreak then in, um, in uh, October the same year. So uh, pretty crude estimates, but they proved to be uh, pretty uh, interesting for uh, aid agencies, which is also why we then started Flowminder in order to do this work operationally. Uh, we've also, this spring, wrapped up uh, a pilot project on climate displacement and migration. So this was in Bangladesh, uh, Cyclone Mahasan. Not a very significant event, uh, but an interesting event enough. So we ran a, a project with ICAD, a local NGO, uh, United Nations University, and Grameen Phone, which is one of the big operators, and uh, published two studies. Uh, one on uh, short-term displacement patterns and activities during the cyclone and another one on long-term migration patterns um, from livelihood degradation. 
Uh, and again, all the work that we do is public domain, so we tend to publish it academically. We publish it on our website, both because we're academics and we think it's fun to publish, but more importantly, it's also a uh, quality assessment of the work because then we have a number of uh, academics uh, validating that the results and the methods are, are good. And it's also uh, sort of our, our public domain work to put the methods uh, out in the open. Um, Again, privacy is a huge deal, I'll get back to that. Uh, so an important note to make is that we, uh, when we collaborate, we never receive any data, we never download any data, we never host any data, we never take custody of any data. Uh, and I'll get back to why, uh, because the data is extremely sensitive for different purposes. We always go to the operator and collaborate with them. Uh, so it's always the operator that retains the data on their systems. Uh, they have full supervision and custody and run all the analytics. Uh, and this, uh, just to make the point, from a privacy uh, perspective, this is uh, deemed to be pretty good because, again, the, the operators have huge security protocols in place. And during the Ebola outbreak, uh, we had, uh, there was a big uh, discussion with the GSMA, the mobile uh, industry organization. So they produced these guidelines on how to protect privacy, which was signed off by some of the major operators in Africa, which, uh, again, is exactly how, how we've been working for the last few years. Uh, then going to the Nepal earthquake, which a lot of people have talked about, um, we actually were in country the week before the earthquake talking about setting up a system. Uh, so then when the earthquake hit, unfortunately that wasn't in place, uh, but we were able to pretty rapidly then uh, contact Ansel and set up uh, the processing flow, produce the algorithms, the data and the insights, validate them, which is the more, more important uh, process piece of the process and then put out these analysis within two weeks after the earthquake. Two weeks is a very long time in disaster response, but when it comes to these types of analytics, it's actually pretty short. So a lot of technical people we talk to usually talk about 14 weeks or 14 months when it comes to setting up systems. So again, not for the immediate disaster response, but for the reconstruction. Um, we also communicated this to all the, the UN agencies, uh, the displacement report, uh, all the major media, because again, everything we do, we take care to engage with the media stakeholders, because again, uh, this is sensitive, so we don't want to uh, make anybody nervous, uh, feeling that we're uh, doing some spying behind the scenes. And again, also published uh, all the results and the methods. So everything we can publish, we publish openly. Um, again, some big te uh, some testimonies from big agencies that you've seen. Again, it's very hard to assess the impact of this kind of work, but um, we try to bet that we can. So what we did is we, we talked to the big agencies to follow up and see how they actually used the, the analytics, which seems to be have helped. And uh, finally, it, it might look uh, a bit cynical both to actually compete for an award and then to uh, put it in the presentation so we won this industry award, but the important note for that, that was actually largely driven by the operator, so to make them happy, we did that. But this is actually a breakthrough for us, because it also shows that our operating model was validated by the, the global mobile industry uh, organization, so, uh, which is kind of a, a receipt that the way we work actually works and is sustainable for the long run. Um, so going through these examples, so in Haiti when we started, and then Bangladesh, and then now in Nepal, this, uh, of course, is very exciting and promising and seems to have some kind of impact, which is why we're working in this field. But then giving these types of presentations and ending up in workshops, a lot of donors and agencies and NGOs, uh, government agencies, are super excited, maybe too excited. And you might have experienced similar things, uh, experiences with drones or mobile surveys or anything that's kind of new, mobile, big data. Um, some people tend to get a bit excited and say, oh, this is super cool. If we can just roll this out, then this is going to change everything. And we never have to go into the field. We can just sit here on our iPads and just distribute aid and see everything in real time. And it's, it's solved. Uh, and of course, that's not uh, exactly the case. Um, Specifically with mobile data, we have the problem that as soon as we say we follow mobile phones, everybody understands, which is actually really good. The problem is that most people tend to think that just because they own a mobile phone and they use Google Maps, they tend to think that everybody has their own mobile phones. And they say if we just get the mobile data, we, we can track the population. And of course, that's not really true. And this is just one example. So in India, this is a few years old, but I think it's still pretty accurate. 
oops, more than um, more than 85 percent or 85 percent have access to mobile phones, so the penetration is very high. But it's actually only 33 percent that have their own phone. So it's only for 33 percent that one phone equals one person. All the other people uh, access a household phone, a friend's phone, a cousin's phone. Um, maybe didn't use a phone for a few months, uh, or they used the neighbor's phone or the village phone. So that means that for most, uh, most countries that are disaster prone, one phone might not represent one person. It might represent five colleagues or a family with eight children or, or a whole village. So a big portion of the work that we have to do is actually understand what the data means. A lot of people think it's just putting bubbles on a map real quick and everybody is used to bubbles on a map. But the mobile data is actually not finished mapping data. It's, it's really complex data. Uh, and just a few things that we've packed, uh, picked up along the way is that any data, specifically mobile data, is not the solution to anything. It's just an input in uh, whatever problem you're trying to solve. And it's only useful if you actually know what problem you're trying to solve. So just throwing a lot of data and data mining it to death won't solve uh, any problems, especially not in a disaster situation. Remote sensing data as mobile data, probably drone data, uh, other types of crowdsourced data can improve and augment understanding of what goes on, but it can never replace having people on the ground, uh, survey data, everything else that comes in. Uh, and then again, just a few things on mobile data is a lot of people say if we just had the mobile data for Philippines, we can do this here. And absolutely, it's possible, but there is no mobile data for Philippines. There is smart mobile data, and there's globe mobile data, and there's sun mobile data. Of course, the different operators only have data on their customers. And these customers are changing all the time because they're changing SIM cards. So even if you get the data today, and then you get the data in a month from now, you run the models, everything looks perfect. It's just that maybe half of the people have changed. You just track the SIM cards, but you don't know if it's the same people. Uh, and finally, a lot of people are really excited about real-time data, which is uh, it's great for drones. And for mobile data, mobile data is also real-time, but for disaster response, the important thing is validation. You need to understand what the, what the data means. And uh, all this validation data, it can be health data, uh, needs assessment, household survey data, it's not real-time. So um, uh, we've been asked sometimes to just put out maps in real-time, which technically we could do, but we wouldn't do in, in Nepal. It took us about four or five days, uh, a number of people working around the clock, in order to put out our maps because we wanted to be sure that what we put out actually represented the actual population or what we thought was the population. So if you have real-time analytics on any type of data without validation, there's always the risk of, of real-time mistakes, uh, unless you know exactly what, what the data means. Um, so these are just some caveats to take along the way. And then to end up on the final note, so I usually end up with all the problems. So in the first few years we did this work, we went around and talking about how great it was. And then in the last few years we've been going around and talking about how not so great it is. Uh, but of course it is an extremely valid, valuable data source and, and uh, the applications are really uh, exciting. And it's really up for discussion among um, UN agencies, government agencies, uh, NGOs, mobile operators themselves. And um, to end up on the point, there has been a lot of talk about data philanthropy, about asking operators to hand this data out. But uh, what we realized is that it takes a lot of work to actually make sense of the data. So all the agencies asking for mobile data is a bit like dogs chasing a car. They're always super excited, but if the dog would actually catch the car, it wouldn't really know what to do with it. It's a little bit the same with, uh, with mobile data. So the, the trend that we see now is moving from data philanthropy to insights philanthropy, actually having the data owners produce the analytics because they have the people, the hardware, the software. What they need help with is to formulate the right questions because if they're in their office, they don't know what goes on in the field. Uh, so I'd like, yeah, I'll end on that point. Thank you. Thanks.